down to 12.30. So I am going to start on time because I'm conscious people will still keep joining us. Um, but I'm, I'm very keen to give all the speakers more of the time to talk than the housekeeping. So um, my name is Colleen Knox and I'd love to welcome you to the Deability, um, Disability History Month event here today. Thank you very much for joining. I know it's an incredibly busy time of year. Now our st staff network has organised this because Disability History Month is a very important month for us. It celebrates the lives and achievements of people with disabilities and it runs from the 18th of November to the 18th of December. Now, this year's theme is about creating an inclusive and compassionate um, NHS, and that does link back to the people promise that we talk about a lot nowadays. Our chair, Maria Butt, asked me to get involved and support this event, and I was delighted to do so because Deability has been a real platform for our staff, and I think we've probably all seen in the last years staff being given the opportunity to choose to share their stories and inspire and educate us with more information about their lives and their employment with the trust so the housekeeping which is very important um, this is being recorded so that we can share with people afterwards and that's very key because a lot of people just couldn't be with us today it's available in different formats and if you direct message or contact deability will provide that for you we are using Slido for the questions and you might see the actual S that's actually an icon on the top of your screens. If you have any comments, questions, anything that you'd like to put in, please just click the icon and then we'll give you instructions on how to do that. Um, and questions will be moderated before they're shared. So keep your, your mics on mute, keep your cameras off because that just helps with the actual IT issues. And we've a lot to cover, so I will try to keep people to time. But just before we go to the first speaker and, and hear from Lucy, I just also wanted to say it's a very special day today because it's the 3rd of December, which is the International Day for People with Disabilities. This is a real international event that celebrates the lives and achievements of people. And actually, this year's theme is about fighting for rights in this post-COVID era. So obviously in the NHS, we're very familiar with the um, stark health inequalities that were identified as a result of the pandemic and the effects of COVID. So it's critical that the, the real experiences of people with disability and long term health conditions are shared and understood. It's important to us as an employer, but it's also important to us as we develop those systems of care for our patients. So it just remains for me to do a very brief introduction. And oh, I can see Claire's just put her camera off. There you go. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lucy Reynolds. This is a real pleasure. Um, she's the Vice Chair of Disability North and a founder and director of We Are Disabled. Lucy is a public speaker, an academic researcher. She's a passionate disability rights advocate. And for me, that passion really comes out. Lucy, I absolutely love your blog, you know, and I would recommend everybody look at we are we are all disabled.org because it's it's a pleasure to read it. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Lucy and we'll hear from her. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. It is wonderful to have the opportunity to speak to you all today during Disability History Month. And today, on International Day for Disabled People, my name is Lucy Wells, and I'm a public speaker, academic researcher, writer, blogger, and advocate for disability rights. I am both a founder and director of the All Disabled Community Interest Company, a movement for positive change, and also vice chair of Disability North, a charity which promotes empowerment, inclusion, and independence for disabled people. My, my, my mission is to explore, challenge and change perceptions of, of 
disability to share, share the inside gauge for my PhD research and my lived experience <coughs> as a disabled person. In my doctoral thesis, I used inclusion as a center, center movement for, for participation, referring to the involvement of disabled people in everyday activities. This includes the removal of barriers and the opportunity to share our views, voice our opinions, and gain equality. The, the workplace is a, is, a, is a key area for inclusion, for inclusion. And I work with organisations to identify and break down barriers in order to bring, to bring about positive and lasting results. As an individual and organisational level, the COVID pandemic has brought about some major changes for us all in terms of working practices, advances in technology, and a greater opportunity for working or having instrumental in improving workplace inclusion for disabled people. A recent survey by YouGov suggested that 90% of disabled workers who work from home during the pandemic want to continue to do so, to do so for various reasons. These include having greater control over their working hours, changing their work routines, reducing their tiredness and fatigue, and an improvement in their mental health. However, many disabled people have found that the transition to working from home problematic with one with one third of the same people who work for home said they lack proper of office equipment such as a desk, chair or computer. The social model of disability aims to tackle environmental barriers and, and the basis and is the basis of, co of the contemporary disability movement Mo came into full inclusion. It was established through worldwide civil civil and human rights activism, activism which evolved over time. The social model of disability was developed to challenge the medical model of disability as it was formalised by Michael Oliver in 1990. Firstly, it identified the political strategy and the, uh, and the removal of, of, environment, of environment areas and promoted inclusion. Secondly, the movement of arguably liberated disabled people and since the mid 1970s, the social model of disability has dominated disability rights. There have been some major steps forward since, since then, including the Equality Act in 2010, which which sought which sought to tackle discrimination and to improve, improve attitudes towards disability. This, the 
his worthy confidence introduced in 2016 encourages employers to think differently about disability. I think I take action to improve how they rec recruit, but retain and develop disabled people. I, I, I believe it is so important to acknowledge how hard these laws and policies were fought for and, the instrument, and how instrumental they've been to the emancipation of disabled people. For example, the work of Judy Human, the American dis disability activist who recognised internationally for her leadership in the disabled community. Uh, I, was, I was born in the late 1930s at a time where, 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 where there was tremendous civil rights movement towards the advocacy for disabled people. Here in the UK, a poor host, Big Big and, and Ken Davis established the the union of, of physically impaired against segregation. The 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 market the the the, the, market, the, the market inspired UP. IAS refined his policy as a result of, of environmental factors that were that, that were imposed on on, on, on individuals with impairments and segregated them accordingly. The policy of, of the UPIAS was was fundamental principles of, of disability, which challenged the key organisations supporting disabled people. Furthermore, it challenged those that first addressed the exclusion of disabled people from social and economic activities. <coughs> Uh, I'm I'm truly grateful for all of this valuable work, without which I I may not have achieved what I have today. Why why this technology can be a valuable a valuable tool in helping disabled people to participate hopefully in many jobs and in industry in industries we also need to ensure that it does not further isolate and exclude us from the workplace and set in the and and society in general it's a fact that impairments can cause barriers and that it's important to address these issues. However, however, I believe that it is actually perceptions which causes the biggest barrier to effective inclusion. This is why, this is when in, 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 in this is Bias has caused a person's disability to be no, to be more noticeable than disabled than, than the person themselves. Or when someone feels that the disability will prevent them from being listened to or understood.
how I cerebral palsy means my movements and my, my speech, which means that even communication with others face to face can be challenging. On some occasions, where I've heard a, co a conversation with people who I haven't met before, or who I don't know particularly well, I can see that, that they feel uncomfortable if they don't understand what, I, what I'm saying. Sometimes they get, they guess and get and get the right end of the stick, which can cause the conversation to go off on a bit of a tangent. In situations like these, I would try to help find a piece of myself. However, however, more often than not, the person becomes embarrassed and they will physically distance themselves. So the conversation should, um, so the conversation came up, which is a shame. Well, people are having difficulty understanding what it is I'm saying. So then actually, I wish you'd just say, it's fun, it, it's fun, it's expensive. Yeah. Then just walk away. I believe that people's perceptions of the officer when they see me, well, see me as a disabled person rather than just a person, which impacts on how, on how they may communicate with you. Communicate with me. For example, when I went for my COVID booster last week, I found myself in an uncomfortable, uncomfortable situation. I was sitting waiting for the the, the vaccine to put, to be put into my arm when another vaccinator said to me, have you a hole on your wheelchair? I ignored him, but he continued to repeat it himself. And then when he wasn't getting a response, <coughs> he proceeded to ask me how fast my wheelchair went. I bet my tongue at first, but I felt that if I'm doing so much work on perception of disability, uh, I, I had to say something. So I told him who I am and what I do, and that he made me feel uncomfortable. He apologised and walked away, clearly embarrassed. I'm, I'm sure that that you didn't mean to film me in any way and probably thought he was, he was being funny. But this is exactly why, why I believe that this is the key area of perception which needs to be explored and challenged. With this in mind, I started my book, We Are All Disabled, at the beginning of the first national lockdown, where we were all marginalised from the society and unable to participate in normal everyday activities. I felt it was the ideal time to promote a greater understanding of disability and greater empathy towards disabled people. 
after all, for a while, we were all, we were all dis disabled. And we were all in, all in it together. The feedback I received led me to conclude that nowadays one of the most significant barriers to inclusion is that I <coughs> feel awkward engaging with somebody with a disability for fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. For this reason, it is vitally important for us to make an effort to open conversation, discussion and debate around perceptions of disability in, in order to challenge bias and combat prejudice. The, 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 the idea behind we are all disabled. I do apologise, Lucy. Somebody hasn't got their mute on. I'm so sorry. Can people mute their? Sorry about that, Lucy. I think I'll just stop for a second. Thank you. The idea behind we are all disabled is that everyone has something that potentially affects their ability to fully participate in society and therefore to classify people as being either disabled or non-disabled. It's potentially unrealistic and limiting. I believe that lockdown and social distancing restrictions has given all, both disabled and non-disabled, the opportunity to live and view life in a different way, and therefore has the potential to be a great leveler. Lover. Disability has started to be acknowledged at a wider level in all its forms and conversations are opening up in terms of disability and mental health. This is why I'm, I, I'm keen to work with the affirmative model of, of disability because it has many synergies with the philosophy of we are all disabled. As it addresses the medium of disability as well as disabled people validating themselves and their identities. The affirmative model was proposed as a non tragic view of disability and impairment, which encompasses both positive social identities, both individually and collectively for disabled people. This model is grounded in, in the benefits of lifestyle of being paired and disabled as inferred that disabled people have a unique way of being situated in society and the perception of disability differs from the lived experience. I encourage disabled people to celebrate their, their uniqueness and be proud of who they are. For me, cerebral palsy 
is part of who I am and is one of the many characteristics that makes me a unique individual. Of course, there are practical considerations to take into account when, commun when communicating with a disabled person and the social model of disability can be helpful in identifying these barriers. However, however for, me, for me, the most, the most important thing is that we acknowledge that we, that we are all human beings and that we are all equal, providing the opportunity to develop effective communication is a really important way to ensure to ensure that everyone within the organization can have their voices heard. This in turn makes it easy to unite together, embrace diversity and become more, more, more inclusive with our workplaces uh, and communities. We, we, we are all disabled in all of our effective communication. And I'm delighted that we were recently awarded community interest company, company status. Our aim is to, is to encourage discussion and debate by creating a safe and supportive space for people to share their experiences and talk about issues that they may find uncomfortable in order to inform, educate and inspire each other. Next year we will be holding the first, the first we are all disabled conference and work and workshop series, which will all which will launch the organisation as a community interest company and also a movement to put it to change. Disabled people were hidden away and excluded from society. For too long. Now that these long held prejudices are finally being challenged, I, I believe that it is now more important, more important than, than, ever, than ever to connect with disabled people so that knowledge about disability is promoted. This will reduce prejudice and discrimination and will promote empathy towards disabled people, bridging the, the, bridging the disability perception gap. I hope the work, the work I'm doing both personally and through We Are All Disabled will promote disability inclusion in society, the workplace, influence governments and public policy and how they impact on disabled people. In turn, it will normalise disability and inequalities will continue to fade, closing the boundary divide. I strongly believe that the more we open up ourselves to difficult conversations and learn to truly listen to each other and try to understand others' point of views, the more open, the more open and accepting society will become. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much for that. And um, I do appreciate some people have had some 
technical difficulties. And also I've realised that we probably need to make the um, the discussion available in, in a different format for anyone who's deaf because the captions are also, um, I think, a bit challenging. But Lucy, I've got something. I hope you don't mind I ask you this from a personal um, preference, first of all, because I'm one of those 83 percent who became disabled during their working lives. I wasn't born with a disability and I've read an awful lot about the social model of disabilities. Great. It's got us somewhere forward, but it's not enough, is it? It, it kind of doesn't challenge some of those ableist views that people are suffering because they have a disability or they're wheelchair bound or, you know, some of that sympathy that people share, probably because they think they're being compassionate. Have you any advice for us as a network how we have those conversations about that? Uh, so, well, this is what we're getting of is for having these conversations about Avery's viewpoints and, 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 and be quite open about how you feel to be a disabled person, about what that means to you about what that means to your, your work colleagues and, and just really trying to promote, promote empathy and understanding with, 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 each, with, with each other. Mm, yeah, it's a good point. Empathy and understanding is about equality, isn't it? It's, about, it's about equality and it's also about being, being, being inclusive and the more we talk about things, the more the, the more we talk about things, and the more and the more we we see this lived experience of disability, the more the more we understand it, and the more we, we accept it, and the more inclusive we become. Absolutely, I agree, and I think that's where some of um, some of the energy and some of your activism is really welcome because it enables staff networks to um, you know be brave and articulate things and enables employers to listen. I think Gates had been quite good at giving a platform to our staff to actually talk and what we've seen in the last few months is people actually putting video clips out talking about their disability and how it affects them and also how they identify with it because, as you said, it's very much a part of who they are. It's part of how they see themselves. It is, yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's something to be proud of. I put a little comment in the chat box because I was really surprised by the 90%. Perhaps I shouldn't have been. Um, maybe as I assumed people would be really keen to come back to work. But 90% of people with disabilities preferring to stay at home do you worry that that might exclude them from some workplaces well, where we yeah. learn from that? Yeah, I do because my old mother said if they want to stay home, then how can we have room to have these conversations? To see if people should be encouraged and supported to to be to be able to 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 be, to be able to, to, to do their work within the workplace and, and get the support that they need. Yeah, and I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of having the right structures and practices and policies, yeah. but it's also about that individual conversation. I mean, it's, it's, for me, I think it's down to individual conversations. Uh, one last thing just before I'm conscious of the time, but I'm really keen if you had any advice for um, colleagues, for managers about how to have those conversations, listening to you talk and hearing how perhaps some people have not approached it the right way, perhaps had good intentions, but obviously didn't have those meaningful conversations appropriately. In a workplace setting, any words of advice about how we can do that? So, um, 
Sorry, could you repeat that for me? Yeah, I'm just thinking about when we're in the workplace, how do we enable our managers and our colleagues to have those conversations the best way to get that equal outcome, that fair outcome, that that compassionate outcome, but not actually that ablest outcome? Yeah, um, um, well, again, creating a safe and supportive place to be able to have the conversation for all of us, maybe, and, and look, look beyond that social model of disability and actually look at, look at the the model of, um, of disability because they because they feel like a model of the philosophy it's very much about being pro, being proud of being disabled and and the and the and the and they you unique next unique next and the and the individual and the individual Visualities, and, and I think when when people think about the 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 uniqueness and, and the individualities and being proud, I think they'll be more confident. They'll be more confident for those conversations to open. Absolutely, and I'm just going to do one last plug on behalf of Maria Butt, who's our, our, our Chair of Deability, to say we've been encouraging people where they feel comfortable to choose to share, to yeah. talk about their disability and how it affects them, or their long-term health condition, how it affects them, and encouraging people to listen. That's brilliant, yeah. Thank you so much. That's been really brilliant. I hope you can remain and listen to the other speakers oh, because I'd well, yeah. love to have your, your input and your participation. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce the next speaker who I know very well. He's worked for the Trust for many, many years and, you know, I celebrate some amazing leadership and, and achievements um, in his role. But this is Dr. Ian Ed. Hi, Ian. Morning. Um, uh, afternoon. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, yes. Um, I'm just going to say that as clinical lead for obstetrics and gynaecology, you've been with Gateshead for a long time. You've got an amazing reputation in the fertility unit for helping, you know, large numbers of people, which is a great achievement. Obviously, strong education and training interest. And I think, you know, I know this from working with you previously, that individualised approach to working with people who are trying to conceive and actually being really supportive of listening to people and supporting them on that journey. So I'll hand over to you and I know that you might need to share screen at some point, but that's absolutely fine. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Colleen. Very much appreciated. And also, can I thank Maria and the rest of the uh, the Ability Network team uh, at the Trust for asking me to contribute to uh, today's uh, webinar and also to be part of the, the network team, which I'm very keen and hoping to get involved with as, as much as possible. So thanks very much for the, for the opportunity for that. Um, first challenge for me is actually going to try and share my screen. So this is where we have the first potential for things to go horribly wrong. So I'll do my best to see what we can do. OK. Can everybody see that? Yes, I can see that. Fabulous. If it doesn't yes. transit, please let me know because uh, I don't want to carry on with the slides if uh, if nobody can see what I'm talking about. OK, so yeah, once again, thanks for the opportunity to, to do the presentation today. And uh, what I've entitled the presentation is uh, is challenging change. And the reason why I picked this this title was because uh, when I was in hospital with the illness that led to my disability, I was frequently informed by medical staff, nursing staff, colleagues, that what I was experiencing was a life-changing event. And yeah, I, I can accept that. But what I wanted to ensure that this was not a negative change and it was still possible to make life changes that were positive. And this presentation is a brief summary of my uh, lived experience, if you like, of how I tried to go about making the changes that were brought about by my disability into a positive experience. And this is largely focusing on the challenge uh, that I faced an, a, on a return to work basis. Now, hopefully um, you can see a picture of me doing my Lawrence of Arabia impression in front of the pyramids in Cairo. And you may find this is an odd, re, an odd slide to pick for my first presentation slide. But the reason I've picked it, it was actually this 
visit, if you like, which actually led to the illness that actually caused my disability. Now, I wasn't in Cairo on a sort of sightseeing holiday event. I was actually, I'd actually been invited there to prevent, to present some lectures to Cairo University. And during some of the downtime, I took the opportunity to see the sights. But unfortunately, on my return, uh, I, I did actually uh, come back with more than just happy memories. And within a week of returning, you'll all have heard of Tutankhamun's Revenge and Jippy Tummy. But I had quite a severe bout of gastroenteritis, which subsequent investigations revealed were caused by uh, uh, an organism caused called Campylobacter. Now, even though I'm a doctor, I'm, I'm as bad as anybody else in terms of immediately when you have any illness problems, you immediately consult Professor Google to find out everything you can, even though it doesn't bear any relationship to what you're actually experiencing. But in my researches on Campylobacter infections, I did learn that one of the rare complications of Campylobacter infection is a condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And indeed, a week after recovering from the gastroenteritis, I started to notice problems with weakness in my hands. And knowing that Guillain-Barre syndrome was a complication of the infection, I did actually seek uh, an opinion from my GP very quickly, who examined me, found some minor weakness in my hands, felt it just warranted observation, so I continued to observe this. And over the next three or four hours, I noticed an increasing loss of dexterity in my hands, which caused me to be quite concerned. So I contacted my GP again, who recommended referral onto the RVI. So I saw a neurologist at the RVI who examined me again, just found some weakness in my hands, perhaps loss of reflexes in my legs. But because Guillain-Barre syndrome can be quite an unpredictable illness, um, I was recommended to stay in hospital overnight just to observe how things went over the next 12, 24 hours. And indeed, by the following morning, I couldn't stand up or walk. And over the course of that day, I, I had progressive loss of function of arms and legs so that by the end of the day, I was completely paralyzed from arms and legs. Fortunately, my head and neck and swallowing and all that sort of thing wasn't affected. And neither were the uh, muscles of respiration because unfortunately, for 20% of sufferers with, with Guillain-Barre syndrome, it can paralyze the muscles responsible for breathing and necessitate admission to intensive care for ventilatory support. I was fortunate in this situation, and I think this is a result of me doing a bit of Googling and knowing what the complications were and seeking, seeking help and starting treatment early to make sure that the progression of the illness was actually arrested. Just a little bit more about what Guillain-Barre syndrome is. We do, because of, it's a bit, bit of a mouthful, we do sort of shorten that to GBS. It's one of these conditions that we call autoimmune conditions in which your immune system, instead of attacking the bug that's causing the illness, it actually starts to attack your own tissues. In my situation, instead of attacking the Campylobacter, my immune system started to attack my nerves, producing the nerve damage and the weakness. It is a rare condition. Uh, it can be quite severe, particularly for those people who require ventilatory support and which has a 5% mortality. Recorded recovery rates are about 85% full recovery. I think it's important to point out at this point, um, the definition of full can be quite variable. And full for some people means a return to work. Full in other studies has, has reported that it's a return of full neurological function. A return of full neurological function, I think, is considerably less than 85% and maybe as low as 50 or 60%. Unfortunately, for 10 to 15%, the uh, disability is permanent, and uh, that's the situation that occurred in my situation. And in terms of the recovery from GBS, uh, we don't call it GBS just to shorten Guillain-Barre syndrome. We also call it GBS for the way you recover, in that you get better slowly. And it's not a matter of days and weeks. It's more a matter of uh, months and years in terms of the recovery. Uh, in, that, in, in my particular situation, it did require hospitalisation for quite a lengthy period. I needed to stay at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle for a month to make sure that the disease wasn't progressing. And then I spent six months at the Neuro, Neuro Rehabilitation Hospital at Walkergate Park. Uh, and I'd just like to sort of uh, thank the, the, all of the staff involved in here for the excellence and high quality care that I received in both of these NHS institutions. It was simply outstanding. One of the issues about being in a, a rehabilitation hospital is that they are a bit like a physiotherapy boot camp in the, which there's periods of intense physio interspersed with longer rest periods. And personally, from my perspective, I've actually found the rest periods a bit more challenging in that in this downtime, there's only so much you can do to keep your mind occupied. 
I went through just about all the box sets there were, uh, Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, Vikings, House, you name it, I watched it, but there still wasn't enough to keep my mind occupied to stop my mind wandering. And one of the issues with this is you start to think about the what ifs. What if I don't make a full recovery? What if I can't get back to work? What if I can't support my family? And I found this very challenging. And so quite early on in my rehabilitation, I sought help with the mental aspect of, of, of challenging the, the situation that I was in. And I was referred for counselling, which I received on a regular basis whilst I was an inpatient at Walkergate Park. And during part of that counselling, I learned about coping strategies, which included things like mindfulness and meditation, which I still use today to overcome some of the stresses and strains that the disability has left me with. I think it's very important that any rehabilitation program from neurological condition does include a, a positive a mental uh, education and, and, and mental health support so to, to in order to maximise the, phys the physical rehabilitation because by relieving the anxieties with what I learned through counselling allowed me to approach my physical rehabilitation with a much more motivational state. However, because of the lack of a mental challenge in the hospital, I was very keen to establish how I could get back to work as quickly as possible. And in order to do that, I needed to refocus on where I was now, what disability I had, what I could do and what I couldn't do. And this, this really boils down to sort of goal setting and being realistic with goal setting. I'm always a very positive person, but I think in the early stages, I was a bit too positive in what I could achieve. Uh, but uh, with, with increasing realization over the, the time scale of the recovery, I did become much more realistic in terms of what I could achieve. I think it's important to appreciate that obstetrics and gynaecology is a surgical specialty and it's what we call a craft specialty. It requires a high degree of manual dexterity for some of the um, operative procedures to deliver babies and surgical procedures. And also, as Colin has pointed out, I have an interest in fertility and a lot of the IVF work does require practical procedures, which again requires a high degree of uh, manual dexterity. And obviously that was going to lead to me making decisions about what parts of that job I can do and what I can't do. One of the issues that was put to me at an early stage in my rehabilitation was whether I would consider an early retirement on medical grounds. I thought about it, but dismissed it almost immediately. At the time of my illness, I was only 52. I thought I was approaching the peak of my career. So this could at a particularly bad time for me, but I still felt that even with any disability that I had as a result of the GBS, I still could offer a lot both to my patients and to the NHS. So it's really, really for me, not an option. So I, I sort of discounted that option at a very early stage. If we look at the can, can do's and the can't do's, um, we've talked about the, the loss of the capacity to do the surgical and obstetric procedures. Now for me, this was particularly galling because one of the biggest highlights and the, the, the thing that gave me the most job satisfaction was this sort of lifestyle cycle event where you could see a couple who were having problems conceiving, you could investigate them, you could diagnose the problem, you could point them in the right direction for treatment, you could help them with that treatment, you could counsel and support them, you could carry out the practical procedures like egg collections and embryo transfers that we do during IVF, you could monitor them through early pregnancy, you could look after them during pregnancy as part of my obstetric role and you could also be involved in the delivery in the immediate aftermath of delivery. So if you like there was a complete life cycle there which for me provided, I couldn't think of a situation which could give you more job satisfaction and to take that away from me was something that I thought I'd really struggle with. The were positives, however, one of the issues about um, the loss of manual dexterity is means I came off the on-call rotor. Obstetrics being as it is means that deliveries occur at all times of the day and night. And when you get into your mid-50s, being hauled out if you bear to try and extract a reluctant infant in a difficult circumstance, and then have to work the following day is quite a challenge. And uh, from that perspective, coming off the on-call rotor, I didn't miss that aspect of the job that much. When I had a chance to think about what I could do, I could look at the elective part of the work that I do. I can still see patients in outpatients. I can still investigate them. I can still make diagnoses about fertility problems. I can counsel and support through fertility treatment. I can be involved, if, if not doing the, the actual practical procedures, but I can be involved in coordinating the treatment cycles, monitoring through early pregnancy and keeping tabs with the patient throughout their pregnancy. So there's a lot of that life cycle event I still can do. And I focused on making my uh, intended job plan based around that. You have to remember also that there's quite a lot of what consultants do that is non-patient facing. 
And consultants naturally during their career will probably start to adopt more of the roles that are non-patient facing, utilizing their experience, and then getting, an idea, getting more involved in terms of the operational and service development side of things. And in my situation, what happened was I was accelerated more quickly into this and probably took it to a larger extent than I would have done had I not developed my disability. But in order to focus on what I could do, I did um, volunteer to take on the lead roles for, for risk and patient safety and safe care, which I enjoy doing, and that's certainly given me a lot of job satisfaction. Colin's mentioned already that I do have a, a strong educational and training role. At the time of my illness, I was a training program director, and I saw no reason why I couldn't continue with that um, it, despite my disability. So. Once I'd actually worked out what I could and couldn't do, the next thing to do was to start the process of coordinating my return to work. And within this, I was very grateful of conversations that I had both with my service line manager and the clinical lead to, to sort through the can do's and the can't do's to come up with a job plan that met service requirements, but also provided me with job satisfaction. The next thing I had to do is try and plan when I could, when I would be in a fit state to return to work, and that involved in, involvement with the occupational health department. And again, I'm extremely grateful for the consultant who I uh, spoke to uh, on regular occasions during my work up to return to work. I think the occupational health consultant uh, at the time of the initial consultation, which occurred about three months into my rehab when I still had quite profound weakness, was quite surprised at my eagerness to return to work. She asked me the question, do I like my job? I guess that was asked to make sure what my motivation, my motivation would be. And my, vote, my motivation was very strong. And, I, you know, I told her I loved my job. And basically, the thing that I needed more than anything else was to get back to be able to, to do what I, uh, what I really love to do. And um, in a way that was, uh, that was realistic. Within this, uh, I was also very grateful to the occupational therapy department. When I did return to work, I was in a power chair. And uh, as anybody who knew me at that time will realize, I wasn't the best driver of the power chair. It took me a while to get used to it. And I think the door frames in both IVF unit and the outpatients department are testament to my lack of driving skills. But with the help of the occupational therapy department, we did manage to sort of convert the consulting rooms. Uh, uh, we managed to apply a little bit of feng shui to make sure that they were a, a little bit uh, of a safer environment to me, to, for me to mobilize my wheelchair. In terms of the timing of my return to work, I actually planned to return to work in January to, uh, 2017, which is actually about nine months exactly after I developed my illness. Now, a lot of people said to you, well, virtually everybody said to me that that was probably being a, bit, a little, little, little bit ambitious. The only person who didn't think that was probably myself. And looking back, I think probably it was a bit too early. And did I jeopardize some of my physical recovery for the need to get back to work? Difficult to say. But uh, I think looking back on it, I think I probably should have spent a little bit more time preparing for this. But I did need the challenge to keep myself going mentally. Uh, and that was the thing I found most um, difficult to return to. And in terms of when I did return to work, I'm very grateful to, to Colleen and the, and the uh, um, uh, Human Resources Department for organizing a, a phased return to work, which is actually longer than most people have with a phased return. But because some of the unusual circumstances in my own situation that was allowed to be done over 12 weeks because one of the things I did find very early on in my return to work was the exhaustion uh, and I think when you develop a disability having been able-bodied to having a disability it's it's difficult to, to appreciate how exhausting return to work situations can be in that situation and to try and facilitate this even further as part of my appraisal process I've now organized it so that I can actually take a day off and work from home on a Monday, which works quite well with some of the uh, training and program work and some of the risk lead. The other thing that I thought was very important was that when new opportunities arose from a professional development perspective, I didn't let my disability hold me back with this. And indeed, within 12 to 18 months of returning to work, I, um, I was faced with the, the opportunity of developing myself in a number of different fields. In terms of the education and training, the post of head of school of obstetrics and gynaecology and health education England in the northeast came up. Uh, this is a step up from training program director. I stood for this uh, and was fortunate enough to get the job. I've done that for three and a half years and I don't think my disability has affected me adversely in any way, shape or form. Similarly, from a fertility perspective, I wanted to get involved in the national picture. Uh, a, a place on the, the British Fertility Society Executive Committee came up, which I stood for and was elected onto. 
This led to me becoming the chair of the meetings committee responsible for organizing the annual fertility meeting of the Joint Fertility Societies. This culminated in me being the program chair for Fertility 2021, which I foresee is one of the actual highlights of my professional career. And again, my disability did not hold me back in this in any way. More locally, I've also taken on the clinical leadership role for this year, and that's also providing me with, with development from a leadership and management perspective and something that I'm really, really enjoying. So where are we now in terms of uh, ongoing challenges? Well, from a physical perspective, uh, I do st still have issues with weakness in my arms and legs. Um, um, I'm working on this and with the aid of orthotic splints and a hiking pole, I can now uh, walk reasonably long distances, usually about four or five kilometers. Uh, I've got back onto the golf course. Uh, I'm playing as badly as I ever did. Uh, one of the positives about this is because I no longer hit the ball as far, uh, I'm losing less golf balls, so I can't hit it quite as far out of bounds as I once used to. Um, in terms of the physical issue at work, one of the challenges I do have is rising from low chairs and steps and stairs. And interesting, one of the things that I volunteered to do when I returned to work was sit on the health and safety committee. Because coming back to work as a person with disability, as opposed to somebody who was non-disabled beforehand, it was quite a shock to me about things that you don't appreciate as a non-disabled person, which become very obvious to you as a disabled person. And one of the things I did as a result of this was a, a review of the accessibility of all of the, uh, the, the Gateshead Trust site. And I found that the oldest parts of the hospital were the ones where there were the most accessibility problems were. And this particularly affected the physiotherapy department. And if there's ever a department where you're going to get a lot of patients with mobility issues going, it's going to be a physiotherapy department. So, Anthony, probably something to look for from the estate's perspective there for the future, I would think. Um, in terms of uh, mentally, I'm still um, in a situation where I can't say there aren't some darker moments, but uh, I, I am able to cope with these with the coping strategies that I've developed. I know when to seek help and who to seek help from. One of the things about volunteering for a lot of leadership posts is that you do tend to sort of open yourself up to criticism. I do find that as, as with, a, with, a, with having a disability, um, I do feel that I am a bit more vulnerable to criticism. And I think once you raise your head above the parapet, then that's something that you have to work on. And perhaps my resilience is something I can work a little bit more on. I think professionally, uh, I'm very pleased with the amount of job satisfaction I get. I'm very relieved that my disability has not stopped me seeking out new and challenging job opportunities. I think one of the things I do have to be careful about is taking on too many things and my colleagues and family are very important uh, factors in that in pointing out when I think they might be taking on too much. And that leads me quite a lot nicely onto my last slide. Uh, I started and finished with a photograph and this is my family, a picture taken on my first day out of Walkergate Park. This was Father's Day in June 2016. Uh, I was let out on for a day release on good behaviour uh, and uh, you have to be aware that disability as well as affecting the person involved, you also need to be aware of the effects of the illness and resulting disabilities on your family. Indeed at the time of my illness my daughter was actually taking, it was in the middle of taking her A-levels and thankfully she managed to pass with fine colours which I was uh, relieved about. Um, I couldn't have coped the way I did without the support of my family and particularly um, my wife, who was essentially my unpaired and unregistered carer through the whole process. There aren't words available to express the depth of gratitude for all the time, effort and sacrifice and love that she's put into my, into my recovery. And this has allowed me to focus on rising to the challenges that I've faced during the rehabilitation process. So that brings me to the end of my brief presentation. Apologies if I've overrun time a little bit but uh, I believe there is a chance if there are any questions to take these later on in the presentation. So thanks very much for your intention and I hope everybody has a good Christmas. <laughs> what a lovely, lovely way of ending that, Ian. Thank you so much. There was so much in there, um, so so many valuable snippets and pieces of feedback and information. Um, and yeah, we are going to a break, so we have one minute before we take just a five minute break. Um, and when we come back, obviously we have our, our I suppose, our keynote speaker to, to hear from. But just before I do, um, I think it follows on from me some of the conversation with Lucy about how do you have these conversations? Because actually, your journeys shown us that those conversations are possible, they can be meaningful, they can lead to the right outcome for, for people in the workplace. And I suppose we have to hold on to those and, and make sure that we practice that some more. Helen's got a hand up. So Helen, do you want to say yeah. something? Um, sorry, Ian, can you just stop sharing your screen? <laughs>
Oh, sorry. It's <laughs> all right. Lovely. Sorry about that, folks. So just to say, we're going to go into a five minute break. It's exactly 1.30. Please make sure you're back, um, you know, by um, 1.35, because obviously we'll have a very special speaker next and I'll do the introductions then. But just to stretch your legs, get a quick cuppa. And as I say, Ian, we'll come back with questions at the end of the next session together. Great. Thank you very much.
Hi, I think is everybody back? I'm going to assume that they are. Because um, yes. hi there, Tani. I can call you Tani after our introductions earlier in the week. That's going to go down on my CV somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pleasure to, to, to see you and to have you talk to us all today. I, I just want to make sure that I do the introductions appropriately. And just to remind people, if they have any questions, just pop them into the slide or and we'll collate them at the end for Ian and also for Tani. So you are one of our you know, most iconic Paralympians and, and actually sports people. Um, and I was looking at this list going, my goodness, five games. 11 gold medals, six times winner of the London Wheelchair Marathon. You have that prominent role and I have to say, you know, I'm, I must thank you for that. Um, you are a very vocal campaigner. And actually for me, reflecting on um, the session today, staff networks are a platform for employees to talk and to share and for managers and organisations to listen. And I think here in Gateshead, they very much do that. But sport is that massive platform. It just takes it to society in a whole different way, doesn't it? So it's a pleasure to welcome you and I'll say no more, but hand over to you to give your presentation. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all today. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off just explaining a bit about my title because I now sit in the House of Lords. Uh, so my full title is uh, the Baroness Grey Thompson, DBE DL of Eagles Cliff in the county of Durham, which is why Tanny is a much better thing to call me. But I live in the northeast of England, uh, have done for, um, oh gosh, the last 25 years, actually. Uh, it's kind of funny how everyone assumes that uh, we all live in London. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm very proud to, to live in, in the northeast because it's given me so much in terms of my sporting and my athletic uh, career. Um, I'm the only person in my family who hasn't worked for the NHS. Uh, my dad was an architect, I'm going to talk a bit about later. He uh, built hospitals because he didn't like building houses for clients, that's how he started, but apparently they changed their mind too much. Uh, my mum worked in the NHS. Um, my sister's a nurse, my brother-in-law's a doctor. And I know, um, you know, hands on heart, I wouldn't be alive if if it wasn't for the NHS and um, the support and some of the treatment mm -hmm. I've had. So I'm going to try and screen share. And bizarrely, even though I've been doing this for like 18 months online, I have never yet had to share my screen. So uh, hopefully it'll of course, work. Of course, in the three little dots at the top of the screen, on my screen they're beside the S for Slido. If you click that, oh no, no sorry. It's just, so I'm getting the wrong one. It's the arrow it's that- It's the arrow, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I'm just- I'm just trying to do that. If it doesn't work, I, I can talk for like three hours with no notes anyway. This is mostly to keep me to time. Um, so I was born with spina bifida and uh, I could walk a little bit when I was young. And uh, basically I'm missing bones at the back of my vertebra. Uh, and I had a bump on my back. We called it my bump. I, there was probably some technical name for it, but that's what we called it. And that was basically full of all my nerve endings and things. So... Um, because I could walk when I was little, I got into mainstream school and that was probably the most impactful thing on my life because everything else kind of came out of, of that. Um, apparently, when I was born, the only question my mum asked was, could I have children? Apparently, she didn't ask anything else. Um, and they sort of went, we don't know. And she went, oh, OK, and took me home. Oh, God, there are so many lucky bits in my life. So my sister was born... Um, with a heart condition, uh, which required surgery as soon as she was born. They then discovered that she had dislocated hips, um, so was in a frog plaster when I was born. And so my mum had quite a lot to do with looking after my sister. So because there wasn't really any outward sign of my impairment at that point, they just got on with it, to be perfectly honest. Um, but because I could start mainstream school, that meant um, a, a huge amount to me because it kind of set a tone for how I was treated. So I was brought up in a family that believed in equality and inclusion before those words existed. And I was very much brought up, when Lucy was talking about social model, I was very much brought up in a social model of disability without us knowing what that was. And so when people treated me differently, and they did for being disabled, you know, parents would pull their kids out of my way at the supermarket and say things like, don't get too close to her, you might catch it. 
my mum always used to say, you know, that's their problem, not yours. Like, it's not your fault you're a wheelchair user, you know, just, you know, they're idiots. Um, and that actually helped me build quite a lot of resilience from, from being young. And when Ian was talking about resilience, it does sort of hit home because sometimes I have loads of resilience and sometimes I have less. So, you know, just before lockdown, I was on the tube in London, half past seven in the morning, going to work. I remember a staff said to me, um, it's the rush hour. I mean, what do you say to that? It's up seven. Yeah, of course. It is. Went, it's very busy. And it's always this tone that people talk to you in when they're being patronising. And it's like, well, yes, I know it's busy because it's up past seven in the morning. And then this person said to me, can you travel when it's more quiet? Because people have got jobs to go to. And I said, well, I've got a job. Oh, have you? Oh, that's lovely. And it, anyway, it carried on being really patronising. And I explained I worked in Westminster and I was in the Lords and all that. And um, and then this person said, oh, well, you know, it's it's lovely that people like you get out. And that's the point I, met, I went slightly facetious and said, well, actually, I'm going into Westminster. I'm going to overthrow the government. I'm going to move into number 10. I'm going to become a dictator. And then I'm going to become when the Daleks land, I'm going to become ruler of the universe. And I was smiling as I was saying this. And this was like one of those moments where people don't listen. And he said to me, oh, that's lovely. But can you do it when it's not rush hour? And for me, it, it's important to have these moments to remember. So some things have moved on and moved on quite a lot. And some things haven't moved on at all in, in the 52 years that I've been on this earth. And earlier this year, the European Space Agency announced they were going to send a disabled person into space. And I got all these phone calls from journalists saying, aren't you really excited? And it was like, well, I'm sure it's lovely, but I can't get on the Northern Line. You know, I, there's a third of tube stations in London that I can use. And train stations were meant to be step free by January the 1st last year. And that came and went. And we've now found out that I will not be able to get on a train independently in Britain in my lifetime because trains are only going to be wheelchair accessible in 2070. Now, as much as I have aspirations to live for a very long time, I don't think I'm going to live that long. And so this is um, some of the things that affect me and have an impact on me and in terms of the campaigning and the platform I try to use. And, and sport does give you a platform. It, it certainly helps you build resilience because um, there's plenty of jobs that are way, way harder than being an athlete. But you do it in the public eye and the public are interesting. They have a view on everything because you've been in their living room. They treat you like family. And sometimes that is lovely and sometimes it's less so. So, um you know, I get quite a lot of, well, you're not as skinny as you used to be. Well, I'm not training 12 times a week, 50 weeks of the year anymore. So no, I'm not. Or things like the BBC have really good makeup artists. Uh, yes, they do. Um, and pe mostly people don't mean to be rude. But um, the because you're competing in this very public environment, it does help build up the resilience. And I'd have to say transferring from sport to politics hasn't been as big a jump as people presume it is, because actually sport is about rules and engagement and doing loads of really boring things to have this moment where you can shine on the track if you're lucky. And politics is the same. You spend a lot of time reading briefing papers and answering emails and writing a speech that you have two minutes. That is your allocated time. You have two minutes to make a speech that will change legislation. So there's a lot of similarities. I'd have to say in politics, there's slightly less not involved because for most of my sporting career, I lived in Redcar and um, trained up and, down, up and down the trunk road covered in snot. Um, but, um, you know, it's what I learned from sport carries on into my life really well. And it helps me deal with those people. I don't always have brilliant resilience, um, but I recognise because I'm treated three very distinct ways. I think it helps give me context about disabled people. So I'm treated one way as a Paralympian, which is generally really lovely. I'm treated a second way as a parliamentarian where people like or don't like me based on what I do. Some people think I'm brilliant. Some people think I'm horrible. 
uh, and I have to say, you know, the first few letters you get saying, you know, you're the worst kind of scum imaginable is quite upsetting. And then you, you kind of put yourself into those person's positions and lives and try and read between the lines of, of what they're saying. But being a parliamentarian is quite different from how I'm treated as a Paralympian. And then the third way I'm treated is as a disabled woman, which is where I experience the discrimination and a lot of microaggressions that I get. And what I find really interesting is we have a daughter. She's now 19. She always looked quite young for her age. But actually, in the last year, people now speak to her, not to me. Um, and that hasn't happened since I was a child, actually, um, or, you know, where people would speak to my parents about me and my parents would always sort of, you know, push the people back to me. And it's been quite interesting that, um, you know, now people will talk to Karis and say things like, is she OK? I mean, Karis has quite a dark sense of humour, so um, which she's inherited from both myself and Ian, my husband. And she'll normally say things like, I've no idea who she is, but she follows me around. And luckily we haven't got into to, to any trouble with people thinking I'm, I'm stalking her or, or something like that. But those three ways, I think, again, are another reason why uh, the way I'm treated, it com I campaign for the things I do because, you know, we haven't moved on in the world as much as I, I kind of hoped we would have by this point. So, um, I stopped walking. Do you know, I don't even really remember because uh, I was young. I was maybe about four, four and a half, five-ish. Um, and there wasn't any pain. Uh, I didn't miss a day of school. I just very, very gradually over about a year and a half lost my ability to walk. And what happened was as I grew, my spinal cord collapsed because uh, there wasn't enough vertebra holding it all together. Um, and it was my own vertebra that severed my spinal cord. Um, but, you know, I said it didn't hurt. It wasn't. And, and I think at that age you adapt. And I just learned to adapt to things very sort of slowly and steadily because it was just almost like every day there was something I could do a bit differently. So actually, as a child, I didn't realise the adaptations I was taking because it happened over sort of a, a long period of time. But where I was lucky was that my dad was an architect before I came along. Every house he built had steps and cobbles because apparently they're aesthetically pleasing. And then he stopped and looked around the world and realised how inaccessible it was. And then were amazing in that they, they sort of stepped away from everyone who said that the only way I'd have a normal life is to walk with calipers and crutches. Actually, they realised the best way for me to have an independent life was to have a wheelchair because that would give me freedom to move around, do the things I wanted, go where I wanted and not have to be reliant on other people. And one of the first things my dad did on my chair was cut off the handles because uh, uh, he was like, yeah, we're not having loads of people pushing you around. That's not happening. And, you know, now I'm in my early 50s. I still don't have handles on my chair. But I'm just getting to the point where I'm thinking, do you know what? Some handles might be useful from time to time because, you know, I'm not an elite athlete anymore. Things things are getting slightly harder to do, you know, harder to push up some ramps and, and things like that. But um, there's a picture of me as a brownie and I'm seven years old and uh, I'm on a brownie pack holiday in Swansea. And there's a little picture of me in my chair and... I'm actually trying to skip. Now, that is never going to happen in a million years, however good you become a manoeuvre in a wheelchair. But I think the reason I was doing it is I wanted to be included with all the other girls that were skipping. Um, and also, I wanted to try. My parents brought me up to believe, just try things, you know, and you try and do it in a safe environment and you just see what you can do. And don't listen to people telling you you can't do things which, you know, I had quite a lot of over the years, but but actually try and and make the decision for yourself whether you can do it or not. Because the thing that was really helpful as well at the time growing up was, I don't think it's true now, but I didn't see anybody who looked like me. Um, uh, disabled people were locked away. They were in segregated education. You know, I, I didn't meet 
very many disabled people. And the only two wheelchair users I saw were on TV. Now, one was I Sight. It's such a naff name for a TV programme, I don't, I don't. Uh, But, you know, he, his character was a wheelchair user. And, you know, he, he obviously could barely push his chair anywhere. Uh, he, uh, the police officer, you know, the bad guy ran away and would run up three flights of stairs across some cobbles across the field and Ironside would be at the other end. And I remember just thinking how ridiculous it was. I don't remember the stories. I remember even at a really young age looking at the portrayal of it and thinking it was stupid. And then the other one was Sandy Richardson on Crossroads. And he was a much loved character. They were going to kill him off. I don't even remember, he was in hospital in a coma. And then everyone wrote in saying, no, don't kill him off. We love him. And so he came out of hospital as a wheelchair user. And any medics, you know, would be, you know, whatever the storyline that put him into hospital, he ends up with a different condition coming out. I mean, there was no continuity in it. But again, it didn't play true to me because you'd see him just randomly leaning up against things. And they actually... They were at the forefront of representation. They were trying really hard, but it didn't connect to me. But I did see, actually, in, in the two TV programmes, was people pretending to be wheelchair users, but not being treated differently, still going about their day-to-day -day job. So in that way, it was it, there was some positivity in it. But I started doing activity. It was about being fit and healthy. It was about being strong enough to push my chair and being independent. And I remember from pretty much the point I started being physically active, I've I've never had a urinary tract infection since. I used to have quite a lot of them. And I love it when, um, obviously, when I'm able to go back and, you know, see my urologist and he'll say, have you had a UTI this year? No, I haven't. And I absolutely believe being physically active is an important part of that. And, you know, it, it's really um, in, important for me to stay physically active, to be um, as independent as long as, as I possibly can. So my upbringing was very positive. The first time I realised I was going to be treated differently by, um, I guess, the systems of, of society was when I was due to go to high school. And I thought I was going to go to the same school my sister was at. The head teacher wrote a letter that said, we don't take people like Tanya at our school. And my parents were incensed. And I remember my mum stomping around the kitchen saying, what do they mean, people like Tanya? And it was uh, 1979. Mary Warnock, Baroness Warnock, had done a lot of work on inclusive education. And my parents were educated and they read newspapers and they knew how to write letters and to fight the system. Uh, and basically, my parents used that piece of work by Mary Warnock and threatened to sue the Secretary of State for Wales over my right to go to a mainstream school. And at the time, there was one school in South Glamorgan that took wheelchair users, and I was allowed to go to that school. And I think, and I remember my dad giving me these white and green papers and saying, you need to read them. And, and me thinking, oh, who on earth does this as a job? Um, but without my parents fighting for me, I wouldn't have had the life that, that I did. And what I see now is it's hard if you have a disabled child. You know, uh, a huge proportion of marriages with a disabled child in end in divorce. Um, it impacts the family. You know, it, there are challenges which we, we can't gloss over, but we need to understand them in terms of being able to find solutions to them. Uh, and, you know, if I hadn't have gone to the mainstream school, I would have gone to a special school. The most exams I could have done would have been three CSEs. I did 10 O-levels. I did four A-levels. Uh, went to university. I, you, you can't do that with three CSEs because the expectation of these children was so low. It was, um, you know, just... Well, we'll just stick them all in this bus. Again, I, I think they were trying to do the right thing. But um, my parents were just, you know, we, we expect more of you. Um, and that's where I got involved in sport and um, played lots of different sports. Um, but wheelchair racing was the thing I connected to more than anything else. 
I loved it that you could train with a team, but then you could do things on your own. And I joined a club and just very gradually started picking up my training. And I'd love to say I was brilliant at it from the moment I started, but I wasn't. Um, I was very enthusiastic. I didn't win a race for the first five years I competed because the best girl in Britain went to my school and was in my year. And um, but it taught me about hard work and about persistence and resilience. And I found a club and a coach and I was under the radar. And I think, again, now, if I existed in the system as a teenager, I would have struggled because I was a late developer. I was a very skinny little child. Um, not very strong, even though I did a physical activity. And I made a significant jump in my performance at around the age of 19, uh, which actually in modern day talent ID would be considered too late. So, um, you know, I get asked quite a lot, do I wish that I could compete now? Um, I, it would have been amazing to compete in London because it was a stunning games. However, I got to work on the games and do lots of other things. Uh, and and do it and be there with some, with a lot less pressure than the, the athletes who competed there. But, you know, as a teenager, I didn't know much about the Paralympics. I watched the London Marathon on TV. I watched a guy called Chris Hallam, Welsh athlete, lived up the road from me, loud, obnoxious, rude, appalling taste in leopard print bodysuits, dyed blonde hair. He became one of my best friends in sport. Um, but he didn't take people patronising him. And so for me, that was... Uh, he was kind of one of my role models growing up uh, in terms of um, looking at him and, and looking at someone who was athletic and strong and didn't take nonsense. Now, my kind of approach hopefully was slightly less rude than Chris's, but he helped give me a voice and encouraged me to have an opinion about how we were treated. And that was was very important for me at the time. So you know, every choice I made from the age of 12 was about being an athlete. I went to Loughborough because that's where Seb Co had gone. And if it's good enough for Seb, it's definitely good enough for me. Um, you know, the timing of my wedding yeah. was based around my competition schedule. Uh, yeah. It's quite hard. I married an athlete when you've got conflicting competition schedules to pick a date to get married. The reason that the point I realized, you know, life, I mean, I always knew it's unbalanced and it's very unbalanced. But after my fourth games, we had a conversation about whether we should try for a family. And I figured I'd need about six months to, to get back to being fit again. And then you might laugh at this. I had to Google how many weeks it takes to have a baby because, you know, we do everything in four week training blocks. And I didn't really know what nine months meant. And I remember the moment it flashed up 40 weeks and it literally was, are you serious? 40 weeks like I mean that's 10 blocks of training I mean that's that's a really long time um but um you know I got pregnant uh uh by the cutoff date because we, we had a cutoff date um otherwise we would have waited another um two years or so before trying um or maybe not actually because I, I might have been considered I was 32 when I had her so I'm not sure we would have gone for trying for a family after the next Paralympic cycle. But that moment in time was really interesting because that brought out some really interesting attitudes from people. I remember ringing my mum and telling her I was pregnant and she was like, oh, wow. And I said, what's wrong? Because, you know, I knew the question she'd asked when I was when I was born. And she was like, are you sure about this? Have you considered it? And I thought she was talking about my impairment. Actually, what she then said was, because you don't seem to really like children. I went, oh, OK. Um, it brought out some more unsavory views than that. Um, I was frequently told people like me shouldn't be allowed to have children. Um, uh, strangers encouraged me to have my baby aborted. Uh, and it sort of went from there. It was all a bit strange and a bit trying. Um, but... Uh, Again, it was those moments because I have a, a incredibly supportive family, my training partners, really, really supportive people around me. Um, it it helped me to step back from some of that, you know, quite serious level of, of negativity um, and put it into to context. So the other thing, I mean, the only slight regret I had was because I knew from very early on because of my spine uh, and spinal cord and um 
I've got this sort of mushy mess at the back where there's no vertebra and my spine sort of spills out. Um, that I was going to have to have a general anaesthetic uh, and a cesarean. So I didn't really bother going to any antenatal classes because I was still training and training pretty hard all the way through my pregnancy. Um, bit of a shock having a baby and not having been to any classes. So, um, yeah, I, I, I could have learned from, from that one. But, yeah, that moment in time was was interesting. And um, I guess, you know, we had to see a social worker and I have no issue whatsoever um, going through that process. But actually, some of the questions they asked were were really offensive, really, really offensive, especially when they found out that my husband had a spinal cord injury as well. Um, and but you have to go through it because, you know, you uh, and my resilience from sport and everything else and my political life helped me deal with uh, very, very intrusive questions. But, um, you know, my daughter's 19, beautiful, wonderful. Too much of me in her. She rolls her eyes, apparently the same way as I do. Um, you know, the last 18 months have been really difficult. Uh, as an athlete, I was away from home a lot. Uh, as a parliamentarian, I live in the northeast. I work in London. Um, I'm home a lot. And the pandemic was an opportunity to, to spend time with my family. So as much as there were really difficult moments of endless Zoom meetings and House of Lords online, which is words I never thought I would ever say in a million years, it also gave me time with my family that I wouldn't have had. I have to say homeschooling A-levels, oh wow. Uh, there was one day I was on a call and uh, I, I was unmuted and Karis came in to where I was working and said, can you help with my chemistry A-level? And I turned to her and said, ask your dad. And we had full teenage drop of, you don't care about me, you don't love me. I'm going to fail my A-levels. I'm not going to get to the university I want to go to. Uh, I'm never going to get a job. I'm going to live at home with you forever. And my response was, you know, honey, I'm not piling you off on your dad, but he does have a PhD in chemistry. Um, I have an O-level. And she sort of left with all the bravado of a 17-year-old at the point, which is, well, he's going to try and teach me, isn't he? Um, and, you know, so the, the pandemic has brought new and interesting challenges and opportunities for disabled people to work from home. Um, you know, for everyone to work from home in a different way has been really interesting. But then you listen to what Lucy said about, you know, 90 percent of disabled people, you know, not going back to work. And again, that shows some of the benefits and some of the advantages we've had through um looking at a workplace in a different way actually has the potential to push more disabled people out of work than get them into work. And already the employment gap for disabled people is twice the national average, um, which is inexcusable, to be perfectly honest. Um, but, uh, you know, we I, I guess a lot of what I do is you have to be internal, internally optimistic about the things that we can achieve. And my, my platform is sport and then going into politics gives me the opportunity to do that. But as much as in sport, I had a training group and partners and people who helped and supported me. Life in politics is the same. I have a, a WhatsApp group of disability activists who watch my back, who send me information, who see what's going on, inform me, um, who follow the legislation that I work on in the welfare reform bill. I The WhatsApp group, uh, at all points, three of the disability campaigners were watching the House of Lords, watching the Parliament channel and and helping me through it. And that's amazing because it's a bit like sport. There's bits that are very glamorous. Competing in Sydney in front of about 90,000 people is amazing. Um, you know, but it's hard work and a lot of really boring stuff that makes that happen. There are moments in the chamber where you can feel the tension and it is really dramatic. Um, but a lot of it, is about doing your hours and, you know, making speeches and interventions and, you know, asking the government questions and, um, you know, challenging them actually to to be better. And I think one of the reasons I'm optimistic or I try to be optimistic is that you know, my career on the track at Paralympics over five games, 16 medals. So I said before, we train twice a day, six days a week, 50 weeks of the year. But to win those medals, 
was 19 and a half minutes of my life. You know, a tiny amount of time, really. And so that's where the resilience movement into politics is helpful, is understanding that you spend a lot of time doing lots of really hard, boring stuff, which doesn't seem very exciting. But you have this moment where you might be able to change legislation and make it better. So the first big bit of legislation I worked on was the Welfare Reform Bill, Benefits for Disabled Children. Um, I was in charge of four sets of votes that day. We lost them all. I remember ringing home sort of slightly despondently at seven o'clock at night. And it had been a really brutal afternoon. And Karis would have been eight at the time. And she said to me, Daddy's made me watch the Parliament Channel. So I said, oh, cool. what do you think? And she went, you're not having a good day, are you? So I said, no, Karis, I'm not. And she said, well, do you think anyone's actually listening to what you're saying? I was like, well, it doesn't appear to be, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of try harder in the next bit. And it's one of these moments where you just love your child sort of so much. And she just said to me, well, keep trying, mummy, because we all love you and we know you're doing the right thing. And it's just go, you have these moments where it's like, all right, OK, I'm going to have another go um, and I'm, I'm going to keep trying. Because my dad told me when I was 21, which I never listened to him, a lot of what he said to me, he told me that I was going to end up in the House of Lords. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, and then when I got there, which was a hugely proud moment for me, um, when I told him his response was, well, I knew you were. Well, yes, what, what, you know, I expected nothing less of you. Um, I have to say my husband's response was, come the revolution. Um, he, he doesn't um, believe in a nominated second chamber. Um, come the revolution, you'll be on the list of people I get rid of. And Karis told her teacher I had a job collecting tickets at Westminster Tube Station. Anyway, um, but um, what I've learned in politics is there's loads of ways to affect change. Some of it's the chamber, some of it's sitting on select committees or other committees. Some of it is in all party group meetings. Some of it is listening to people. Um, we also have something which is really powerful. The two things which are really powerful. We have House of Lords headed paper where if you write to somebody on that, to a business or a company, they kind of tend to have to reply. So I work on train access and, you know, if one of the train companies doesn't respond to me, I write to the minister. So, you know, they, they are reactive to, to what we say. The other thing which is really powerful is afternoon tea. Now in the Lords, we take afternoon tea very seriously. Uh, we are unbelievably privileged. We have our own pastry chefs. I mean, that is, I mean, hugely privileged. But if you're, if I'm challenging a company on how they've treated disabled people or their disabled employees or access or whatever it is, and you say to them, tell you what, would you like to come in and have some afternoon tea and we'll have a chat? And it's beautiful and it's lovely. And I didn't realise before I went there that you have dry cakes, which are rock cakes and scones and wet cakes, which are cream cakes. And you have runny honey and sticky honey I just kind of called them honey um but you you can sit with someone in this beautiful environment and you can challenge them in a really positive way now that is not to say I don't get angry oh I do I get angry about lots of stuff I get really angry but for me it's about channeling channeling that anger into positive change and and sometimes you do have to uh, metaphorically stamp your feet and and shout and you know be challenging in a more overt way but actually I'm not interested in doing that unless it brings about change you know change is something that is really important to me because I don't want young disabled people to be fighting for some of the things that my parents fought for sadly you know the academy's legislation allows head teachers to exclude disabled children just because they're disabled you know we we saw at the start of the pandemic and I, I, I do genuinely understand the reason for this, but compulsory do not attempt resuscitation orders were put on some disabled people with no underlying health conditions. Um, and I get rationing, I get, talk to my sister a lot, you know, she's been on a COVID ward for 18 months. Um, hard, hard, that is genuinely hard stuff. Um, but it leads to this question in the wider world, how are disabled people valued and included? And 
we haven't had that moment. We haven't had the Me Too moment. We haven't had um, the Black Lives Matters moment where the world stops and says, what are we going to do differently? What we have had is the, you know, the London Olympics and Paralympics, which was stunning and amazing and incredible. But it's two weeks of a sporting event and it can influence and it can start a discussion and, you know, we we can do things with it, but it can't fix it all on its own, you know. And so one of my challenges now is that a lot of young disabled people, the only option for work they're being given is we'll be a Paralympian. Well, not everyone wants to play sport. Not everyone can, but, you know, the reality of it is, you know, only a very small number of people get to be a Paralympian. And we should be telling young disabled people that they can be doctors and nurses and lawyers and teachers and, and all those things, not actually just, you know, saying Paralympian is, is the only option that you've got. And it is frustrating when people in sports say to me, 2012 changed the world for disabled people. And I have to sit and say, you know, it changed the world for some Paralympians. And it was an amazing moment in time, if you like sport, it was. Um, but actually, just because we hosted the Paralympic Games 10 years ago, that doesn't mean that we don't need to keep trying to do something uh, in a better way and in a different way uh, to make sure that, that disabled people are included. So part of it is, I mean, really important part of it is, is events like this. Um, as Lucy said earlier, it's about listening to people's lived experience, listening to what happens to them day to day, um, knowing when to step in and maybe offer help. But listen to a person who says, no, I don't need your help. A friend of mine who's um, a doctor of history is visually impaired, has a white stick and a guide dog and works pretty close to the RNIB. Several times a week, people grab her and try and take her to the RNIB. And we joke about it because we have different impairment. We can and we sort of say, you know, oh, are they all living there this week? Um, I'm sure there's people out there who think all oh, blind people do live at the RNIB. But but we have to keep challenging those stereotypes and those perceptions and in so many cases the baby steps I do a lot of work on train access um the reason I tweet about it is not to get to necessarily the train companies I mean it's partly to let them know what's happening but the reason I tweet is to educate non-disabled people about the lived experience so when they see someone who's a wheelchair user who's stuck on a train they might stand in the door or they might get a guard or they might shout at someone on the platform. They might be able to offer that help. Uh, and I'm going to have to say, I'm going to just terribly badly name drop here, but growing up in athletics, um, Kelly Holmes, we, we've known each other for 30 years and uh, she's a good friend of mine. And she'd been, she'd seen some of my tweets and she saw a wheelchair user stuck on a train. So she stood in the door and she shouted and she then, because uh, there was no ramp available, she asked the wheelchair user, would the wheelchair user be OK if they were lifted off the train? The wheelchair user said, yes, please. I just need to get off anyway. So Kelly, being ex-army and being an amazing athlete, shouted at some men on the train and said, basically, you lot come and help. Um, and, you know, then she got in touch with me and said, that was the right, was that the right thing? And we said, yeah, it was. And that is amazing because, you know, that is the help and support disabled people will need because that will then filter through to other people to think about change. Um, you know, we can all make adjustments, we can all make reasonable adjustments, and that's a really important part of making disabled people feel included and involved and part of the decision-making process, and that's ultimately what they want. So the final thing I'm gonna say is basically the thing that kept me going through all this was, my granddad had a saying, it's Welsh. It, uh, I'd love to say it loses something from its translation from Welsh to English, but it doesn't. It just sounds more lyrical in Welsh. But my granddad used to say, aim high, even if you hit a cabbage. And apologies if you're expecting something more intellectual. But it's about having a goal and a dream. It's about trying. And, you know, it's about, I've, I've made it to be what I want it to be to some extent. But it's about don't hold people back. Don't judge people. Don't judge what they can't do. Help and support and empower them to do the things they can do. And if we do that, we make the world a much better place for everyone. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon. Thank you very much. That was that was really interesting. And I didn't miss the, the photographs at all, to be honest. So that was brilliant. 
I'm just conscious we have some questions and we have some questions for Ian as well. So I don't know if Ian wants to, um, I, I don't know if Helen's going to take, I, I'm probably spotlighted, but I'll, I'll run through them. And I do apologise for the order. I'm sliding around between a few different mediums to get the questions here. So I think one of the questions probably for the organisation is a reflection on accessibility. And I'm probably lucky in that Anthony's already discussed their plans to look at accessibility and audits again. But that's a common theme, isn't it? It's a theme for Ian as an employee and it's a theme for Tani as a uh, as a commuter, as a, as a, a parliamentarian, as, as somebody out in society. Um, is there one little nugget of what you would say to us we need to think about when we when we consider accessibility? From my perspective, as, a, as, as an employee, um, one of the things, as I mentioned in my presentation, was looking at the trust site from when I was non-disabled to when I was disabled and thinking about things that aren't obvious to somebody who's non-disabled become immediately obvious to somebody who is disabled. And it was simple things like drop curbs not being in the right place, chairs in clinic being too low, chairs in clinic not having... Um, uh, handles to help you get up if, if, if you're not wheelchair man but you've got leg mobility issues as I have and there's, there's sort of simple things that you can do to, to dwell on that the other thing that I noticed when I did the review of the actual trust site was it's very much dependent on the age of the building as to what the accessibility like particularly from a wheelchair when I had my power chair I went to the old part of the hospital it was a nightmare for me and this is the issue I had about physiotherapy being where it is. Um, so I think that, that there are some sort of simple things that you can adapt. And I think one of the things that would be important from a trust perspective is when you're thinking about new estates development, I know there's building regs that factor in for disabled access and things, but have somebody who has a disability to look at it and, and work out what's the, the easy ways and what's, what's the right way to, 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 to sort of design things. That would be my sort of uh, recommendations from things. I can see you nodding there, Tani. I think that's that's probably a good cue for you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, part M of the building regs are woefully out of date. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, bring in people with lived experience and and don't be afraid to ask and, and get them to, to challenge back. So, you know, I work in a building. Uh, so there's been a building on the site in Westminster since 1079. That's why we call the Mother of Parliaments. The building I currently work in and have an office in is about 400 and something years old. Uh, not only is it the most inclusive place I've ever worked in terms of people, but the access is really good. And um, I mean, partly uh, we've got the oldest revolving door in London, which is the way I go in, and they've adapted it so that it, it sort of collapses so you can get through. And it's still a beautiful revolving door. Um, you know, I, I really hate ugly concrete ramps because that just means you haven't thought about you know, universal design. So it's it's talk to disabled people. And when I went there, I did ask for a ramp in one place, which would save me about three miles a day walking. And they said to me, oh, I'm not sure we can do it, but we'll try. We might, we'll probably put a temporary ramp in. I come back a week later, there is a full, beautiful concrete ramp in. And I said, hang on a minute, I thought you said you, you couldn't put, you know, it was only gonna be temporary. The member of staff said, yeah, it'll only last 50 years. That is temporary for the House of Lords. So, so you can do things. Um, but I, I think the thing is, if disabled people don't complain too much, because if you complained every time there was something that just was a bit inconvenient, you spend your whole life doing it. And most people have got better things to do. So bring people in at the earliest stages and use the expertise that's out there because it does make it better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And I've, I've got another question um, for Ian, which actually I think is probably relevant for both of you. So I'm conscious of the time. So this might need to be a summary. What are the three things that you think as an employer are the priorities for us to support staff with disabilities, Ian? Um, to be honest with you, Colleen, I think having having visited other trusts, I actually think our trust is one of the most inclusive. I've not had issues with uh, with any with any of my real aspects of of getting back to work. But um, um, I think one of the things about um, the members of staff, I think I think both Tani and Lucy mentioned these in, in her in, in, in both their presentations, and that's about um, educating staff in terms of the, their attitudes and behaviours towards. The person with the disability and recognizing the person not the disability one of the issues that i've had with with my condition which is a, is one that gradually improves 
that um, because people that I see on a day by day basis may not see that, that the improvements that I'm getting, they focus on the fact that I've come back with a disability and they don't focus on the fact that I can start to develop to do things mm -hmm. and encouraging people to sort of be aware of what disabled people face, I think, is an important thing from, from, from that perspective. But yeah, it's um, as I say, I've had I've had very very positive experiences from from the support I've had with the trust, from from management side of things, from occupational health, uh, occupational therapists, yourselves in HR. It's all been very positive experience, and I think we need to keep that going really. We do. Thank thank you very much for that. There's a common theme, isn't there? And I love the social model of disability, but it doesn't quite go far enough in changing attitudes. So I suppose, Tani, if I directed this question to you, what what pearl of wisdom or nugget or a piece of advice would you give other than your resilience and your challenging change to get us to maybe affect a positive change? Um, I think the network is a really important part of that. And I'm not saying that just because I'm on, a, you know, the meeting about it in, in different companies that, that I work with. Um, the network is a really important part of being able to gather ideas and issues and present them forward. I think for me, it's about having other people to talk to that you can share the challenges and maybe have a bit of a rant and then calm down and figure out. But, um, you know, it, it's about having an environment where people feel able to, to raise the issues. And I think what we know is that, you know, disabled people for a long time um, are very reluctant to, to complain because they think it's going to affect their job because it's very hard to move jobs. Um, you know, a lot of disabled people end up feeling quite grateful to be in work, which is sex. You shouldn't have to be feel grateful, you know. Um, and it, it's having a space where you can you can raise those issues to bring about change and keeping educating. You know, you can always be, you know, educated. And uh, my husband had a spinal cord injury when he was twenty when he crashed his bike, so he's he's a mixture of incomplete bits on his spine, so he's quite wobbly when he walks. And people very very occasionally he used to use a chair people would treat him very differently if he was using his chair mm -hmm. to his sticks because in his sticks it's a skiing accident or something like that um i have to say um he had a stroke last year 58 he's, he's doing amazingly well he's he he, he, he joke i have to say jokingly says it's because i lived at home with him for a year and he's surprised <laughs> it took that long um but you know now he he wobbles differently mm -hmm. and that for us has been quite an interesting time because we never questioned how he walked or really looked at we just he did so so for us as a family we're now doing things in quite a different way from how we used to so he uses his chair a lot more than he used to so um it's uh we've been very the the doctor amazing saved his life um but um yeah it, it we can all learn and, and we've both learned from that process i've been in wheelchair for my whole life and he's been a wheelchair user or paraplegic for 30 years mm -hmm. so whoever you are you can always learn no, thank you for that. That feeds into something. We've had a question about leadership and management and development programmes. I think that's the education piece that you're talking about. And I think taken from what you've, you've, what you've both said and also from what Lucy said, it's about relying on that lived experience of our staff and our staff who are also managers um, to actually inform those leadership and development programmes, isn't it? Very yeah. much so. Yeah. It's got to go from the top. Mm. Yeah, no, that that's brilliant. I'm very conscious of the time. Somebody else has actually put a quick question in about language, which I would like to cover before we move on to the closing remarks by Anthony. Um, can we reflect on language? Um, people with disabilities, disability, you've interchanged language throughout the presentation and it caught my ear. And I'm very much um, a, a, a grown up with this understanding that some people nowadays, for example, would say I am an autistic person. Somebody else would say, I'm a person who has a disability and it's about choice. But do you have any views from your perspective on language? Uh, I, I was always a bit worried about the disabled term, but I think I think Lucy summed it up when she, she introduced a we're all disabled and it's very few people that don't have some degree of um, ability issue that prevents them um, engaging 100 percent with everything in their life. And I think it's just a, it's a matter of degree, really. So although I was initially a little bit reluctant to use the words disabled, it, it's not something that I find has been an issue for me um, more recently. So I don't know how Tanya feels about that. But uh. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people who work in sport don't like saying disability sports. Yeah. Um, uh, and they use the word para, which I really dislike. 
because you know you've got a paraplegic you've got paralympian mm. we don't call um an untalented 12 year old who doesn't play sport but does it very occasionally an ollie athlete but we call a disabled untalented child who does a bit of sport a para athlete so so i have really strong views on um language um absolutely people have to choose the language that they 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 choose to use but for me i'm a disabled person um i'm not that keen on with a disability because um it's to me that sounds like I'm a person with a handbag or a rucksack. That sounds like something I'd be, it's, it's part of my my whole life all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's how society impacts it. So I, I just stick with the language in the Equality Act because uh, mm-hmm. that's just easy. And, but what I try to do is not use the word disabled unless I absolutely have to. So mm-hmm. try just minimise the, the use of it. Yeah, but only when it's relevant. Thank you both and thank you to Lucy as well because that's been amazing. I'm conscious we have Anthony Robson here who's one of our executive directors and actually Anthony is the um, sponsor for Deability and has been a great partner to us. So I'll hand over to Anthony now. Thank you, Colleen. Um, you know, I'm executive lead for Deability in, in the Trust um, and I, I just want to thank everyone for attending um, and the speakers, um, Dr. Lucy Reynolds, our own Mr. Ian Aid and Dame Tanny Gray Thompson. And, you know, how do you close this off? I think it, it's, I mean, I've enjoyed it so much. I don't want it to end really. Um, it's It's been compelling. It's been uplifting. It's been motivational, um, you know, inspirational. And, you know, it, as, as Lucy started off with, We've sort of sat um, under the the challenge of uncomfortably challenged, um, and I'm I'm sure that has changed a lot of our perceptions. Um, we've lived life experiences with with Ian and with Dame Tanny, and we've we've seized the day. So you know all of those headline topics have have, have come through. Um, Lucy talked about working from home, which has changed our expectations and given improvements to work and life choice which has been a brilliant thing, um, you know, for, for D-ability, but um, for, for the post-COVID life experience, if you want. But it's it's been mindful that not everything is for everyone and, and things like isolation must be looked at, um, you know, very closely and, and avoid it where it becomes a further, a further barrier to inclusion, if you want. So I think, um, you know, the, this perception is so key, which, which Lucy reminded us of, um, as did did Ian and, and, and Tani. And, you know, the, I think Ian spoke about challenging change and bringing positivity to what was a, a monumental change in, in his own life. And we can get so much from that. Um, and, and, and particularly one of the things that I've learned is that I keep telling my family not to Google illness, um, but Ian sort of put that out as a, it, it could be a positive thing. So I might have to change my um, opinion on that um now because it, it helped him so much and i think it was you know a, an inspirational lesson to all of us about taking things for granted um you know the the importance as well of coping me- mechanisms you know stop saying what if what if um you know having a strong mental motivation and strength and and dame tanny used you know um so many perfectly um presented sort of uh, ideas and in, in life experiences for us all to take, you know, so much from. And I, I think there's, you know, the, the message from everybody today has been about, you know, not less, not letting disability hold you back. Um, and, you know, I think it's all about for us to look at perceptions, how we can change things. And, you know, some of the, the things there around the trains, for example, and, you know, not being you know, accessible in our lifetime is is really appalling, really, to, to think that we've spent so much time um, now trying to move things forward and we can't do that within our lifetime. But, you know, we, we keep moving, we keep challenging um, and taking every day to take another step forward. Um, and I think one of the, the things that Dame Tanny um, said, which I, 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 I'm going to jump on is, I'm going to stop saying months and saying training blocks now because nobody will understand what I mean. <laughs> um, and it'll, uh, it'll help me to get over the, the, the time frames of delivering buildings, but certainly now delivering buildings which, with much more accessibility. And I think bringing people um, who are wheelchair users on board and on site to, to road test anything that we do. So 
thank you very much to everybody once again. And um, it's been absolutely brilliant. And I hope you enjoy the rest of, of, of the month. Uh, thanks a lot.